This is for educational purposes only. Master Key System by Charles Hainel. Part 14. You have found from your study thus far that thought is a spiritual activity and is therefore endowed with creative power. This does not mean that some thought is creative, but that all thought is creative. This same principle can be brought into operation in a negative way. Through the process of denial, the conscious and subconscious are but two phases of action in connection with one mind. The relation of the subconscious to the conscious is quite analogous to that existing between a weather vane and the atmosphere. Just as the least pressure of the atmosphere causes an action on the part of the weather vane, so does the least thought entertained by the conscious mind produce within your subconscious mind action in exact proportion to the depth of feeling characterizing the thought and the intensity with which the thought is indulged. It follows that if you deny unsatisfactory conditions, you are withdrawing the creative power of your thought from these conditions. You are cutting them away at the root, you are sapping their vitality. Remember that the law of growth necessarily governs every manifestation in the objective so that a denial of unsatisfactory conditions will not bring about instant change. A plant will remain visible for some time after its roots have been cut, but it will gradually fade away and eventually disappear, so the withdrawal of your thought from the contemplation of unsatisfactory conditions will gradually, but surely, terminate these conditions. You will see that this is an exactly opposite course from the one which we would naturally be inclined to adopt. It will therefore have an exactly opposite effect to the one usually secured. Most persons concentrate intently upon unsatisfactory conditions, thereby giving the condition that measure of energy and vitality which is necessary in order to supply a vigorous growth. Part 14. 1. The universal energy in which all motion, light, heat, and color have their origin, does not partake of the limitation of the many effects of which it is the cause, but it is supreme over them all. This universal substance is the source of all power, wisdom and intelligence. 2. To recognize this intelligence is to acquaint yourself with the knowing quality of mind and through it to move upon the universal substance and bring it into harmonious relations in your affairs. 3. This is something that the most learned physical science teacher has not attempted, a field of discovery upon which he has not yet launched, in fact, but few of the materialistic schools have ever caught the first ray of this light. It does not seem to have dawned upon them that wisdom is just as much present everywhere as our force and substance. 4. Some will say, if these principles are true, why are we not demonstrating them? As the fundamental principle is obviously correct, why do we not get proper results? We do. We get results in exact accordance with our understanding of the law and our ability to make the proper application. We secured no results from the laws governing electricity until someone formulated the law and showed us how to apply it. 5. This puts us in an entirely new relation to our environment opening up possibilities previously undreamed of, and this by an orderly sequence of law which is naturally involved in our new mental attitude. 6. Mind is creative and the principle upon which this law is based is sound and legitimate and is inherent in the nature of things, but this creative power does not originate in the individual, but in the universal, which is the source and fountain of all energy and substance the individual is simply the channel for the distribution of this energy. The individual is the means by which the universal produces the various combinations which result in the formation of phenomena. 7. We know that scientists have resolved matter into an immense number of molecules. These molecules have been resolved into atoms, and the atoms into electrons. The discovery of electrons in high vacuum glass tubes containing fused terminals of hard metal, indicates conclusively that these electrons fill all space, that they exist everywhere, that they are omnipresent. They fill all material bodies and occupy the whole of what we call empty space. This, then, is the universal substance from which all things proceed. 8. Electrons would forever remain electrons unless directed where to go to be assembled into atoms and molecules and this director is mind. A number of electrons revolving around a center of force constitutes an atom, atoms unite in absolutely regular mathematical ratios and form molecules, 
and these unite with each other to form a multitude of compounds which unite to build the universe. 9. The lightest known atom is hydrogen and this is 1700 times heavier than an electron. An atom of mercury is 300,000 times heavier than an electron. Electrons are pure negative electricity, and as they have the same potential velocity as all other cosmic energy, such as heat, light, electricity and thought, neither time nor space require consideration. The manner in which the velocity of light was ascertained is interesting. 10. The velocity of light was obtained by the Danish astronomer Rho Emmer in 1676, by observing the eclipses of Jupiter's moons. When the Earth was nearest to Jupiter, the eclipse appeared about eight and one half minutes too soon for the calculations, and when the Earth was most remote from Jupiter, they were about eight and one half minutes too late. Rho Emma concluded the reason to be that it required seventeen minutes for light from the planet to traverse the diameter of the Earth's orbit, which measured the difference of the distances of the Earth from Jupiter. This calculation has since been verified, and proves that light travels about 186,000 miles a second. 11. Electrons manifest in the body as cells and possess mind and intelligence sufficient for them to perform their functions in the human physical anatomy. Every part of the body is composed of cells, some of which operate independently, others in communities. Some are busy building tissue, while others are engaged in forming the various secretions necessary for the body. Some act as carriers of material, others are the surgeons whose work it is to repair damage, others are scavengers, carrying off waste. Others are constantly ready to repel invaders or other undesirable intruders of the germ family. 12. All these cells are moving for a common purpose and each one is not only a living organism, but has sufficient intelligence to enable it to perform its necessary duties. It is also endowed with sufficient intelligence to conserve the energies and perpetuate its own life. It must, therefore, secure sufficient nourishment and it has been found that it exercises choice in the selection of such nourishment. 13. Each cell is born, reproduces itself, dies and is absorbed. The maintenance of health and life itself depends upon the constant regeneration of these cells. 14. It is therefore apparent that there is mind in every atom of the body. This mind is negative mind, and the power of the individual to think makes him positive so that he can control this negative mind. This is the scientific explanation for metaphysical healing, and will enable anyone to understand the principle upon which this remarkable phenomenon rests. 15. This negative mind, which is contained in every cell of the body, has been called the subconscious mind, because it acts without our conscious knowledge. We have found that this subconscious mind is responsive to the will of the conscious mind. 16. All things have their origin in mind, and appearances are the result of thought. So that we see that things in themselves have no origin, permanency, or reality. Since they are produced by thought, they can be raised by thought. 17. In mental, as in natural science. Experiments are being made and each discovery lifts man one step higher toward his possible goal. We find that every man is the reflection of the thought he has entertained during his lifetime. This is stamped on his face, his form, his character, his environment. 18. Back of every effect there is a cause, and if we follow the trail to its starting point, we shall find the creative principle out of which it grew. Proofs of this are now so complete that this truth is generally accepted. 19. The objective world is controlled by an unseen and, heretofore, unexplainable power. We have, heretofore, personalized this power and called it God. We have now, however, learned to look upon it as the permeating essence or principle of all that exists, the infinite or universal mind. 20. The universal mind, being infinite and omnipotent has unlimited resources at its command, and when we remember that it is also omnipresent, we cannot escape the conclusion that we must be an expression or manifestation of that mind. 21. A recognition and understanding of the resources of the subconscious mind will indicate that the only difference between the subconscious and the universal is one of degree. They differ only as a drop of water differs from the ocean. They are the same in kind and quality, the difference is one of degree only. 22. Do you, can you, 
appreciate the value of this all-important fact. Do you realize that a recognition of this tremendous fact places you in touch with omnipotence? The subconscious mind being the connecting link between the universal mind and the conscious mind. Is it not evident that the conscious mind can consciously suggest thoughts which the subconscious mind will put into action, and as the subconscious is one with the universal, is it not evident that no limit can be placed upon its activities? 23. A scientific understanding of this principle will explain the wonderful results which are secured through the power of prayer. The results which are secured in this way are not brought about by any special dispensations of providence, but on the contrary, they are the result of the operation of a perfectly natural law. There is, therefore, nothing either religious or mysterious about it. 24. Yet there are many who are not ready to enter into the discipline necessary to think correctly, even though it is evident that wrong thinking has brought failure. 25. Thought is the only reality. Conditions are but the outward manifestations, as the thought changes, all outward or material conditions must change in order to be in harmony with their creator, which is thought. 26. But the thought must be clear-cut, steady, fixed, definite, unchangeable, you cannot take one step forward and two steps backward, neither can you spend twenty or thirty years of your life building up negative conditions as the result of negative thoughts and then expect to see them all melt away as the result of 15 or 20 minutes of right thinking. 27. If you enter into the discipline necessary to bring about a radical change in your life, you must do so deliberately, after giving the matter careful thought and full consideration, and then you must allow nothing to interfere with your decision. 28. This discipline, this change of thought, this mental attitude will not only bring you the material things which are necessary for your highest and best welfare, but will bring health and harmonious conditions generally. 29. If you wish harmonious conditions in your life, you must develop an harmonious mental attitude. 30. Your world without will be a reflection of your world within. 31. For your exercise this week, concentrate on harmony, and when I say concentrate, I mean all that the word implies. Concentrate so deeply, so earnestly, that you will be conscious of nothing but harmony. Remember, we learn by doing. Reading these lessons will get you nowhere. It is in the practical application that the value consists. Learn to keep the door shut, keep out of your mind and out of your world, every element that seeks admittance with no definite helpful end in view. George Matthew Adams. Part 14 study questions with answers. 131. What is the source of all wisdom, power and intelligence? The universal mind. 132. Where do all motion, light, heat and color have their origin? In the universal energy, which is one manifestation of the universal mind. 133. Where does the creative power of thought originate? In the universal mind. 134. What is thought? Mind in motion. 135. How is the universal differentiated in form? The individual is the means by which the universal produces the various combinations which result in formation of phenomena. 136. How is this accomplished? The power of the individual to think is his ability to act upon the universal and bring it into manifestation. 137. What is the first form which the universal takes so far as we know? Electrons, which fill all space. 138. Where do all things have their origin? In mind. 139. What is the result of a change of thought? A change in conditions. 140. What is the result of a harmonious mental attitude? Harmonious conditions in life, thought, immaterial though it may be, is the matrix that shapes the issues of life. The mind has been active in all fields during this fruitful century. But it is to science we must look for the thoughts that have shaped all thinking.